evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Atmosphere Reviews Podcast Award Show. Um, we are presenting some awards at the moment because that's what people do at this time of year. All the celebrities are here. All of us. Little, uh, little summer house. Yeah, in the waiting shed. with bated breath for yeah. the awards that we are going to be handing out. Totally fictional awards that we have right here. To real celebrities, table. though. To real celebrities. To real celebrities. We're going to shove a polystyrene cup that we've painted gold in an envelope and send it off to to Dear the Revenant. Yeah, Dear the, the Revenant. <laughs> <laughs> that yes. Is, that is actually its postal address. And of course, um, for us, we're very excited to start the world's most prestigious film award show, um, soon to be. Um, I actually think this is a, a pivotal moment, really, in in, in cinema I think blogging this, history. This could be the moment we finally get the recognition we deserve yeah, absolutely. from the international film community. Absolutely. Um, and without much further ado, let's get on to our first award. First category is Best Actor. Best Actor. Now, usually it's one of the most sought after um, awards. I mean, for us, I mean, I'm sure they don't even know, really. But I mean, we can pretend we're sought after. That, that, that's what. I, can we? I, I, I can't imagine the people we're giving these awards to would mind that okay. we've given them the awards. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so the way that we're going to run this this evening is that each award, um, Andrew and I have both chosen a a choice, a, a winner. For our for our respective awards, we have awards. a cage fighting arena outside, and the two people we choose will go into the cage, fight it out, and a winner will not be announced. Yeah, <laughs> they're just doing it for fun. We've, got, we've got we've got hundreds of these fictional we, awards. We're not even paying them; like it, they just we just oil them off and they do it themselves. Right, Harrison <laughs> Ford has a mean left hook, <laughs> and he hasn't even got in the cage yet. <laughs> right, so Andrew. For your winner of Best Actor for 2015-16, who are you choosing? I chose John Boyega. Star Wars. For Star Wars, Star yes. Star Wars, and why is that? Because, and this is where it starts to sound weird, I picked him because I really, really love the character of Poe Dameron. Who was played by Oscar Isaac. Who was played by Oscar Isaac. Now, at first, I thought I was going to give this award to Oscar Isaac because Poe Dameron is just so cool. But then I realised, and I stopped and I thought about it, and I realised that the reason that I like Poe Dameron, because he's not actually on the screen all that much after the first bit, but the reason I liked him is it's mainly for that one moment when Finn sees that X-Wing pilot in that long take that just destroys all those all those TIE fighters, and he's just... That's one hell of a pilot, and you think, oh my god, that's Poe Dameron, and just Finn's joy. And I realised that what it is what, what it is that John Boyega plays so brilliantly is that just, that really genuine affection. Mm. And it, I just thought any actor that can get me to love a character just because his character is so fond of that. I, be, I was piggybacking on their bromance. It's, and, it, John Boyega very much managed to capture what it would be like for, if a Star Wars fan were in a Star Wars movie. Like, with that scene that you've just, just uh, spoken just about in particular. The, the joy his character expressed at being in the film, and just the way he handled being in scenes with Harrison Ford, and and not being taken aback, and not falling... Holding his ground as a, as a new character. Yeah, that Absolutely. was just, Absolutely, absolutely. So well done, John Boyega. You have... You may step into the cage and await your combat. <laughs> <laughs> well, to fight John Boyega... I have chosen Mr. Mark Ruffalo for his performance in Spotlight. Um, for me, it was a close one uh, when choosing this. My, my other choice, the runner-up for me, was Samuel L. Jackson in The Hateful Eight. Not necessarily the most nuanced of performances, but certainly for me, I think that The Hateful Eight was Samuel L. Jackson's career best, without a doubt. Say what you will... Snakes on a Plane may be an amazing film, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but for me, the I, hateful I eight. I would try and quote him in the accent. I'll just <laughs> let's let's not just in case. Respectfully, not. yeah. I don't want to have to edit more stuff out. <laughs> I I I chose Mark Ruffalo because um, his performance in Spotlight, his accent, while believable, I thought was a little bit like uh, he sounded very childish in it. And for those of you who've seen the film, you know what I mean. But I, I liked his performance as a very quiet and reserved journalist doing his job and loving it. But what makes the film 
is that moment in which Mark Ruffalo being told that no, we can't print the story of these priests fiddling kids yet. We can't. <laughs> we can't. We can't. Um, probably not, yet. not the best bit to laugh at, right? No, probably. <laughs> uh, the scene when he kind of it reaches breaking point. He's been told he can't print the story yet. Can't print the story yet. Can't run it. Can't run it. And he basically breaks out in this rage. Doesn't turn big and green, but breaks <laughs> out in this rage at Michael Keaton. You know, when's it going to, when, how many more kids need to suffer for fucking, before we have to print this? I'm doing it no justice, obviously. Um, <laughs> God, come but, on, guys. Let's uh, just print this. Uh, okay. It's not nice, <laughs> but we have to do it. No, but all joking aside, the scene did nearly bring me to tears. Genuinely, I was, I was awestruck with it. And not, not because it was necessarily a sad scene at all, but it was, he, he's, but it's this pure the emotion. Raw, the raw power. Absolutely, emotion. I was, I was, I was in tears. It was, it was beautiful and also an amazing film. Um, yeah, well done, Mark Ruffalo. Uh, bring me the head of John Boyega. <laughs> anyway, while well, those two fight it out, let's move on to the next category, which is. Best Actress. Best Actress. Um, so, Andrew, who have you chosen to be your Best Actress? I have chosen Charlie's Theron. <laughs> yes, obviously I, I picked her for Mad Max Fury Road. Because, okay. Because, I mean, it's been a while since I've seen the film, but she completely stole the film. It wasn't, it wasn't. Man, it wasn't about Mad Max at no, all. He was all. he was basically luggage. It was about her yeah, saving absolutely. some people, and he just sort of tagged along because they had a car. <laughs> Pretty much, uh, that, I mean, I, I mean, he helped out. I don't put he, that on the on the back of the box in the DVD, <laughs> certainly. But yeah, no, but it's, yes, it's not a film about Mad Max, certainly. But she stole the film and made it so much better for it, and um, that is why I chose her. Okay, and that's an interesting choice. I mean, not to undermine you at all, obviously. I wouldn't like to do that. Uh, I mean, for me, personally, I think Charlie Theron was very, very apt and very good in that film. But, and we'll come on to this later, spoiler, 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 but I feel that Mad Max is not a film about the performance, but it's more a film about the universe that it's set in, perhaps. But I can't help feeling that... I don't know her character and the way she played it was yeah. different enough. I mean, it's it's not like any sort of other character we've seen in a film before, particularly. No, absolutely, and I think that's what. And I mean, in yeah. any other action film, she would have been the love interest, and she and Mad Max would have had a fling, had a whatever. mad baby. <laughs> but in this, she is the hero. Yeah, absolutely. Mad Max is an, is a sort of morally conflicted sort of. He's a sort of grey area. Mm. He just wants to sort and, out his own agenda for the most part. And she's a very deeply sort of conflicted her own battle in a very I mean to have to use fucking gender roles but in a very traditionally masculine sense and because she's this female but at the character same time, she's, it works incredibly well it's it's, it's a very she's impressive like the film. mother figure to all these yes, girls that they're yes. trying to save but at the same time she's it's the perfect empowered woman she's but... not just some sort of gun toting badass mm-hmm. she's a far more interesting and not sexualized at that. all and, no yeah and also she has an arm missing and she has an arm missing so ticks all the boxes no, doesn't it really i know yeah it's great <laughs> and you just you wouldn't have expected that from <laughs> an action film about cars <coughs> racing across a post-apocalyptic <coughs> desert no i totally agree with you yeah that good 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 choice andrew I, I take it back i take my <laughs> undermining back um my choice uh now it does sound unoriginal because you went first with the best actor but my choice for Best Actress, personally, because um, I don't particularly think of the films that I've seen, anyway, um, I don't particularly think that it's been a very strong year for actresses. Granted, I have not seen Carol, um, Brooklyn, or... Brooklyn or Room, three very female-heavy films. I will, you know, hold my hands up to that. But of the films that I have seen, my Best Actress has to go to Daisy Ridley. <laughs> for much the same reason as you chose John Boyega. Um, in so much as... Well, I chose... I think your reason <coughs> for choosing Daisy Ridley is more to do with how well she did in the difficult role she was in. Absolutely. My reasons are basically centred around Poe Dameron and... Because you fancy Poe Dameron as, well, as much as he does. Yes, yeah, basically. Yeah, okay. Whereas I think your reasons <laughs> for choosing Daisy Ridley are different enough to yes. be worth you going into. All right, then. No, but my reason for da- Daisy Ridley, I think, as a new actress, 
Um, and she is, in, in, term, in Hollywood terms anyway. As a new actress, she was given the mantle uh, much the same way that Mark Hamill was of this... Of this actually, no, probably more importantly than Mark Hamill was because, you know, Mark, Star Wars didn't exist when Mark Hamill was chosen. Um, and, and as a lead, as a female lead in a community that, you know, had such a backlash against having a woman in Star Wars and having a black stormtrooper and all this kind of stuff, like, she, she held the story so well. She started off not badly, but a little, a little rocky to begin with, but the performance got stronger as the film went on, and I, I can't wait to see Ray's journey. Um, she made me her, her performance. Her character development has only just begun, and she's already exactly changed. the character has changed. Exactly, her performance is so engaging. Um, it's not heavy-handed at all. There's a lot to her that we don't know, but at the same time, we we feel a bond. Um, and like I say, because she's been given the mantle of the main character of Star Wars, she's held her own, and she's done really, really well with it. I think actually, she's probably done better than Mark Hamill. Without a doubt, <laughs> Mark Hamill was not a good actor in in A New Hope. Like, no one watches, no one watches The New Hope and go, God, I can't wait for them Luke Skywalker scenes. No, that, that's not a thing, like. <laughs> so, Andrew, our next award is... The Funniest Unintentionally Comic Scene, or FUCKS. To give it the acronym. Give the acronym. So, to whom are we giving fucks? Well, Andrew, it was very difficult to choose the, the, the fucks for this year. Um, <laughs> come on, we're better than this. Right. No, we're not. Right, um, on my fucks are going to be given to uh, the final scene of The Danish Girl. Um, we spoke about it in the last podcast, very briefly. Um... The end of the Danish girl, Lily has died, transgender has been invented, um, uh, and it was all very peaceful. They'd gone back to the, where she'd grown up and all this sort of lark. And they had her scarf that she treasured so dearly. And a gust of wind came past, and it danced in the air freely to express that now she had left her body having, you know, popped her clogs. And then the, the, the scarf dances around in the wind in possibly the most atrociously, laughably cliché thing I've seen. It's not a metaphor. Yeah, not necessarily just this year, but in a long time. Like, uh, uh, it and was it's, awful. it's made worse by the fact that they're in the place and they, it's the place they lost the kite many, many years earlier and they talked about it earlier in the film. Oh. And it's the place... With the five trees that um, but, Lily has been painting oh, this whole time, oh, and it's just incredibly. I heavy just, I just think to, to to really sum it up, how much how much it irked me was that during the the entire film we sat there and we really enjoyed it and we it kind was, of and I just went ah oh, like really happy to you like ah. Oh. It was a cloyingly sweet taste at the end of a was reasonably horrific. good film. Uh, so, who, who your I am, f- I'm giving my What are you fucks. doing with your fucks? I'm giving my fucks to the same film, but for different reasons. Okay. I mean, we touched on this last episode, but the cameo by Vladimir Putin... <laughs> <laughs> still, it's still not... It's still funny. Like, the, how much he looked like Vladimir Putin. It's just... In my mind, it, it was Vladimir Putin. I don't care who they say <laughs> the actor is. I don't care it's that he's actually another person. Vladimir Putin secretly is totally into the whole gay rights, sort of gender fluidity, transgender thing. He loves that. He wanted to be part of it. He got a part in the film. And that is why. That's the reason that the Danish girl is still a little bit special to it's, me. It's, it's a laughable film in uh, many aspects. In many aspects, it's a brilliant film. Not a, gr- not, not a masterpiece, but it is a really enjoyable movie. But also, it is cliched... And it is just, it's got Putin in it. Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, watch it just to see if you'd give a fucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's now time for Best Director. Best Director. Well, again, another hugely heralded award. Um, one of the most important things in cinema is sort of who goes down as the best directors. Um, so, Andrew, why don't you start us off? Who's your best director? My best director is Sam Mendes for 
Not Spectre, but the first ten minutes <laughs> of Spectre. <laughs> Which is, if you haven't seen it, it is possibly the best bit of any Bond film ever. It is one of the best action sequences I have ever seen, and my reason is, is this. During that first ten minutes, which is set in Mexico City during the Day of the Dead sort of parade, it's, it's a lovely, brilliantly conceived, brilliantly shot sequence. But the reason it was so special was, I thought James Bond was going to die <laughs> in the first <laughs> ten minutes of a James Bond film. I was sitting on the edge of my seat thinking, holy crap, he's going to die. What the hell is going on? He's going to actually, I can't take this. And then I thought, no, Andrew, calm down. It's the first ten minutes of Spectre. You've seen the trailers. You know he's going to live. <laughs> Christoph Waltz turned up. Yeah. I know. And it was just... But I genuinely thought he was going to die. Yeah, and no, I, really I totally agree with you. But that was something I'd never experienced in a James Bond film, ever. I, I, I think I, I totally agree with no you. no action film have I ever felt that involved in what was happening in the action. I was totally on the edge of my seat the I entire time. Been, and well, so early on, so early the first on ten minutes of it as well, well to, be, to be that involved. Yeah. The only problem, really, with Spectre is that it keeps on going after it, those yeah, ten minutes. Yeah, I mean, if it had been a short... If, do you know what? I think that's what the James Bond franchise needs is a series of shorts not features shorts when James Bond does some cool shit and it just ends that's yeah, what I want to see don't bother there. stringing it up no it doesn't need a plot don't need to know about international criminal conspiracies just literally just go there shoot the guys and then yeah, finish yeah just in one in one like and also like with the opening ten minutes like that first long take that it starts with oh. if you could just have a series of shorts that were just like that in various locations with various set pieces I'd be quite happy <laughs> It was, yeah. It, the Spectre's worth going to see just mm. for those ten minutes. And that is just on the basis of those ten minutes, Sam Mendes is getting one yeah. of our polystyrene cups with gold paint. Because, Absolutely. Well done, Sam. Because it was really special. It's yeah. just a shame that he couldn't keep it. He just did the rest of the, the movie. Absolutely. With the rest of the film. My best director has to go to Mr. Quentin Tarantino for The Hateful Eight. Um, because this is coming as a shock to this me. This is coming as a shock because I've changed my mind since we last spoke about this, which was about twenty minutes. <laughs> which is about ago. twenty minutes ago. Um, no, I, I have decided now that Mr. Tarantino deserves it because it is his masterpiece. It is his opus, without a doubt. It is one of it, I, I've 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 always had a very keen eye on Tarantino's career. Like, from, from Reservoir Dogs, which is one of my favourite films, I absolutely love it. Pulp Fiction, which I, I believe is not necessarily overrated, but is um, overexposed. It is, it's over, it, everyone speaks about it. everyone's like, oh, you know, Pulp Fiction this, Pulp Fiction that. Like, it's a, it's a fucking cracking movie. It Liking really is. Liking Pulp Fiction does not make you a film critic. No, exactly. Doing a podcast like this makes you a film critic. It does. It does. Shut up. It does. We promise. <laughs> um, that's what I've told him. He won't listen. Right. But no, I, I think a lot of Tarantino's work has been overexposed and oversaturated. Certainly, um, and I think a lot of his um, his later stuff has been very interesting. And I think that's the word for it. You've got. I think the Kill Bill films are great and ultra violent, but they are balls to the wall. Tarantino dicking about with the camera and some effects and stuff. But they're a tribute to crappy 70s martial arts films and it does perfectly with that then you've got stuff like and also a birthday present weren't they to um, what's the name the woman in them it was Thurman yeah really they gave her the script as a birthday present and said I'm going to make this film for you as a How birthday present how fucking conceited I know <laughs> Apparently she was fine with it. I think she helped him write some of the costumes. Oh, fair. Um, or was involved in and it. And then you've got, you've got Inglorious Bastards, which, um, granted, I do definitely need to rewatch it. But for me, I, I enjoyed Inglorious Bastards, but I was taken aback by how slow it was. Um, it, intermittently slow, obviously. Like I, I still haven't forgiven it for, um, for what it did to Michael Fassbender. <laughs> you don't introduce him as a character. <laughs> Just to have him die in the same scene. <laughs> have his nuts blown off as well. But, but in all fairness, it was before Michael Fassbender was Michael Fassbender. In so much as Michael he was... Fassbender has always been Michael <laughs> Fassbender. And I don't just mean that in the 
obvious in the legal sense, sense. <laughs> which is technically true. <laughs> but um, and then you've got Django, which I was. The D is silent. Indeed, indeed. I, I very much enjoyed Django, but I was a little disappointed by it in parts. In that, it, I think it suffered from fatigue in certain scenes. Uh, that it was good, but the but it wasn't as grounded as I think it needed. It wasn't as levelled out. Whereas every kink that you could possibly think of in any Tarantino film has been ironed and hammered out in Hateful Eight. It is the perfect mix between his ultra-violence, his stylistic madness, the, the slow cinema stuff that he likes to throw in now, um, and this, this tension as well. Like, it, 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 what's interesting about Tarantino's films is that they really have come full circle. You start off with gangsters doing a jewellery heist, someone's a mole, it's all very tense, and it's all very stylistic. And you come more gangsters, more stylism... And then you get to Jackie Brown, more crime, but, but but becoming a bit more grounded. Then you get fucking Curveball, and you get Kill Bills and all this kind of stuff. So that's getting a bit more grounded with Inglorious, yada yada. Goes fucking nuts with Death Proof, but it's going through all the different genres. Mm-hmm. Then it comes around all the way around to Inglorious, like I say, a bit more grounded. But now it starts doing historicals. And then we get Django, and then we're back with a Western that has the tension and stylism of Reservoir Dogs. He's just done this full circle, and it's ah, it's incredible the way he's done it. I, I used to like knock Tarantino a bit for being a bit, like I said, overexposed. The man's a fucking genius. Uh, he's uh, he's come back to being one of my heroes, without a doubt, just on just on that alone, and just because of his direction. And that's why he's my favorite. Director. He's that's why he's my best director this year. Well, we can Bosh. send him. We can send him one of those polystyrene cups, and he can die a happy man. Well, now we move on to best cinematography. Best cinematography. Um, well, I'm going to get my side out of this, like just done and out of the way, because. It's the third year in a row he's going to win it in the bloody Oscars. So, Emmanuel Lebeski. <laughs> just take the fucking award. Just take it. You know you've already got it. Oh, you did Gravity. That was amazing. That, but you did Birdman. Groundbreaking. The Revenant. One of the most beautiful pieces of pure cinema. Take the award. Right, Andrew, take over. Like That's done. <laughs> <laughs> I decided, because I'll be honest, I don't know an awful lot about cinematography, I decided to give this to Sam Mendes for the first <laughs> ten minutes of, of Spectre. Because, I mean, I, I genuinely can't, I can't, I can't talk this up enough. It was actually amazing. I mean, the rest of the film was terrible, but, well, not terrible. It was a James Bond film. It was, you know, mediocre James Bond. Anyway, so, yeah. Have two polystyrene cups, Sam Absolutely. Mendes. There and, you go. And bear in mind my criticisms when you don't direct the next Bond film. <laughs> but as a, as a footnote, though, Emmanuel Lebeski, one of the genuinely most talented human beings that is on the Hollywood scene at the moment. Jesus Christ, that man! Is, that man's career has blown up. Like he he can just pick and choose whatever that fuck he wants to do now because he is the top of, to win best cinematographer three years in a row god we haven't seen the Oscars yet because it's not happened but I fucking tell you it's going to he's going to win it like without a doubt but The Revenant isn't as brilliantly shot as Birdman oh Andrew it is oh it is it's not it's different but it's it's pure cinema and the Academy eats that shit up Birdman like. made empty corridors interesting to watch for reasons I don't understand, the True. cinematography in Birdman made me want to watch Empty, Empty Corridors, Corridors oh, yeah. and think, oh my god, this is intense and awesome. Watching The Revenant, I mean, yes, it's beautiful American sort of countryside. Frontier. Doesn't really do it, doesn't really do it. yeah, frontier rather than yeah. countryside. It's too rugged <laughs> to be countryside. <laughs> yeah. You wouldn't go for a picnic here. Yeah. Where, so where did but, you shoot, where did you shoot, um... Where did you shoot the Revenant? Oh, we just shot it in the Bristol uh, in the Bristol Plains. You know, a bit of countryside. That's all we needed, really. <laughs> yeah, it's the uh, well, but I mean, it pains me a little to say it, but the the frontier that they shot, I didn't find that as captivating as I found the corridors of the theatre. But I, I I I do agree with you to an extent. But I think that comes more down to that could be because of what the films are. about. It's more about the film. I think it's more about the direction than anything else. Uh, and I do I agree that it's not necessarily as captivating. 
but as far as the cinematography goes, there, there's the old saying that every every frame a painting kind of thing, and and with a lot of films, you know, you get that you've got um, the films of Peter Greenaway very much focus on this idea that every sort of frame is this kind of pastiche of 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 the painting. Everything's beautifully laid out. Like the Greenaway, if you if you just Google Peter Greenaway cinematography or just Peter Greenaway, you'll see these beautiful wide angles that look like a Baroque painting. Same thing with, with Kubrick's Barry Lyndon, very much what he was trying to do. And it, The Revenant does exactly that. Every frame looks like a fucking Bob Ross painting. <laughs> That's why it's so incredible. Um, but yes. I will admit it's well certainly, certainly better than I could have done. So... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> the Atlas Film Awards awards because you did it better than we could <laughs> next category is da, 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 da. best opening most disappointing continuation now, uh, well, I'll, I'll 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 step in and do my one. Oh uh, yeah, I wonder what, I wonder what it could be. I really do because unless I can think on my feet in the next few seconds remaining to me while I ramble on about what I'm going to do in the next few seconds, it's going to have to be Spectre. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you've heard me talk about that. Enough, so right, right. Um, um, my my choice for the best opening. And then most sort of disappointing continuation of the film would be Avengers: Age of Ultron, which, believe it or not, came out this year. Well, <laughs> so, technically last. Well, year, last year, but, but how long ago did that cycle. feel? Jesus. But um, I didn't necessarily find the rest the rest of Age of Ultron disappointing, though I know some people did. However, my opinion is totally biased because, as I've mentioned previously. I am a comic book fiend. I am a disgusting nerd for comics, and you just put Captain America on a screen, and I'll throw money at it basically, and, and have a little cry with with joy. That's the Marvel marketing. Yeah, scene. pretty much. Like just people yeah, like me. We put Captain America on the screen, and people will throw money at it. That's very much. That's very much my relationship with Marvel at the moment. To be honest, like Civil War trailers aren't looking as good as they could be. Don't care, Captain America's <laughs> in it. <laughs> But the opening, the opening uh, sort of sequence of Age of Ultron. The reason I like it so much is that it doesn't dick about with the usual superhero fare of who's an origin story, yada yada yada. Like the origin story, you know, obviously, have, like it's it, not like let's have um, Natalie Portman slowly walking around a car park talking about advanced physics. Well, exactly, yeah. Like there isn't there isn't a real setup to it. Um, the setup of the film comes. Like twenty minutes in, like which I think is a really, really good way of doing it because you're already hooked. Like the the origin story, fucking air quotes there. Like that happens is Ultron becoming sentient and what have you, which is done really, really nicely, and it's it's woven into the film where it doesn't feel too much like an origin story. Like you know, the amount of times we've seen Spider Man's origin story already, like in the last kind of. Fifteen years is just. We get it. We get. He got bit by a spider. spider. Really? We all know. It's yeah. so. Well I don't think there's anyone who doesn't know. Like anyone who's going to cinema knows Spider-Man got bit by a spider. We're just aware. The tension. Oh my god! No, if he's not careful, that spider's <laughs> going to. Bu- oh my god! He will. He, he might die. <laughs> he needs to see a doctor fast. <laughs> They're in a lab. Surely they'd have anti-venom. <laughs> anyway, um, but the opening term, the opening sequence of of Avengers: Age of Ultron. You know, we're in this snowy plains at this Hydra base, and you've got all these superheroes just turning up out of fucking nowhere, kicking ass. And there's that shot which was used in the trailers, and everyone went really, really excited for when, from sort of left to right of the frame, the Avengers were all jumping forward. You've got the Hulk going to smash as he is wont to do. Hawkeye drawing his bow, Captain America with his shield, and all this kind of stuff, all in a row. It was just this beautiful shot. And it was the most comic book action scene that I've seen in, or that I feel has been in any Marvel cinematic film yet. The rest of them have all been really good, but they've all felt kind of more like, more like candid action scenes. Mm-hmm. Whereas this one, for the first time, I really felt like, 
Oh, it's a comic! It felt more where it was coming from. Yeah, exactly. It felt much more that, like, okay, we now know who all the characters are. Sure, you're going to introduce us some more, and I'm looking forward to it, but, like, we know where we're at in terms of, of the style. Like, phase one's done. Let's get on with the real meat of the of it. However, as as the film goes on, I mean, I still really enjoyed it. I, I had a great time with it. But like I say, that's my... It that's doesn't my, live up to yeah, exactly. as good as it was, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I didn't feel that the, the kind of... The big climactic fight scene was as good as the big climactic fight scene in the first Avengers film. I think... But I think that's why I give it the award. Because the first opening sequence was just incredible. Like, I loved it. Is outstanding technical element. Outstanding technical element. Um, do you want to start us off? What's your I most outstanding technical my element? My outstanding technical element is the bear from the Revenant. <laughs> and this is this is because I'm still not entirely sure how they did it. I could look online and find out, but I feel that would be spoiling the magic. Absolutely. Now the thing is, there are three ways I can see they could have done it. One way is. Leonardo DiCaprio was CGI, and the bear was CGI, and it was all just CGI of a bear attacking a CGI Leonardo DiCaprio. That's quite a lot of complicated CGI, and if they can make a CGI Leonardo DiCaprio that good, they don't really need Leonardo DiCaprio anymore. <laughs> the other don't way... tell him that, Jesus. <laughs> and the Oscar goes to CGI Leonardo DiCaprio, <laughs> who's just sat there like, ah, God, it hurts. And the awards go, just go... It just seemed more realistic. Yeah, sorry, Leo. See you later. Better luck next year. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, the second way they could have done it is by somehow, well, having the real Leonardo DiCaprio lying there and then the CGI bear. But it's seamless between... I mean, the Mm. bear stomps on his face. How... I mean, he's a good actor, but I don't know any actor that can actually squash their own face at will as if it's being hit by a bear's paw. So, there's the third that'd option. Be, that'd be a hell of a party trick, wouldn't it? Oh my god, that would be incredible. But... <laughs> have, you, have you seen Dave? He can make his face look like he's being squished. <laughs> at, at will. <laughs> but yeah, so, I, I don't know how they can have done that, but there's the third way, which is, it's actually just a guy in a bear suit. And they've been lying to us. But they've made such a good bear suit, no one's noticed. <laughs> now, I don't know which of those three it is. I think it's probably the second one. But, to be honest, if it's any of them, it's still incredible because I, it's, I mean, whenever it's it comes genuine to, technical, technical wizardry. Whenever it comes to stuff like that, I'm just so happy good. to think that it's just Andy Serkis. Like, just, just put it down to Andy Serkis. He's not been credited for the film, but if it was just like, oh, we didn't want to credit him because whatever, I'd be like, yeah, no, no I totally believe that's Andy actually, Serkis. Actually, he was the landscape. <laughs> <laughs> He's got so good now. He was the natural lighting. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I, I totally agree. He's gone out there. He doesn't play characters anymore. He plays backdrops. <laughs> <laughs> this is me doing a castle. <laughs> no, I agree. With you. I think watching it. I mean, I, I've got. I've always had quite a good keen eye for CGI and stuff like that. Um, and watching it, at no point did I ever think that it was a CGI Leonardo DiCaprio. Don't get me wrong. Some of it, some of his bits at point, at points must have been. <laughs> Oh, um, it's part of his contract. Yeah. The film he goes in his bits of CGI <laughs> to make them look more impressive. There, were defi- there must have been definitely elements of his figure that were CGI for the sake of continuity and all that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But I, I still, I watched it the entire time. And I, the bear, there were definitely CGI, but like, I have no idea how it, in, uh, like, how it interacted so well with Leo. It was, it was dumbfounding. Honestly, incredible. And I look forward to kind of finding out in due course how it was done. But I won't go searching. If I'm told, I'm happy. But I don't yeah. want to search, as you say, and ruin the magic trick. It's like myself. ruining a magic trick. Yeah, a big Finding time. out how they did it would be ruining a magic trick. My, my choice for best technical element is the editing for Mad Max. Um, very much has to be, without a doubt. The, the cinematography alone was brilliant um, not necessarily outstanding but um, but absolutely fantastic one thing um, there are there's a video floating around from sort of behind the scenes of Matt Max where George Miller's talking about the cinematography and and when you kind of just listen to the way he describes it it almost sounds obvious that well obviously you'd do that if you were making a film but you'd be surprised what he talks about is that in several scenes 
they would basically, not literally, but when they were filming it, have a sort of imaginary crosshair in the middle of the screen. And at all times, in certain sequences, everything that you needed to look at had been placed in the centre, the very dead centre of the screen, so that your eyes didn't have to move. Then there were other scenes where, where if you had... There's like the scenes when they go through the the valley that eventually gets blown up to stop the other guys, when the motorcycles are going. There's a bit where sort of Max is on the right-hand side of the screen, and he looks round and it cuts, and from right hand of the of the shot, a bike, and this is the next cut, a bike jumps over to the left-hand side, and your eyes watch it cut, and the next thing you need to look at is on the left-hand side of the screen. So your eyes aren't constantly flicking. And the way that that was all edited together, and the fast-paced editing of, of the entire film is like... There aren't many shots that last longer than a few seconds in the film, apart from in the sort of the slower scenes. Mm. But in the action scenes, it's you almost, you almost, if you didn't have this kind of crosshair and leading effect, you wouldn't be able to process what you were seeing. And the mix between the cinematography, the direction, and the editing, especially. Yes, thinking about it now, you're talking about it. Yeah. I'm suddenly realizing it was very intense, but I could follow. But it. you knew exactly what was going on. Well, that's why. The, yeah, absolutely. Those sneaky cinematographers. <laughs> See, this is this is the best part about this podcast because Andrew is slowly learning more about film, and it's great. <laughs> By the end of this, he's going to know more than I do. <laughs> Biggest snub. Biggest snub. Of course, every year the Oscars come out and there's always a controversy over sort of which films have been snubbed. Last year, Selma, of course, was a big one, as well as the Lego movie, which I think is still... One of the best justice. animated films. Oh, one of the best, yeah. One Definitely of the best, the best Lego film. Without a doubt. I mean, the Bionicle ones, they, they weren't great. No, they, I, they I enjoyed right. the first one as a kid, though. The first one was dope. I did quite love the... Uh... Films anyway, enough nostalgia. <laughs> enough Lego-based nostalgia. Um, my my personal snub this year um, w- was Black Mass. Um, not necessarily a huge classic, certainly. I will admit that. However, I feel... I, I don't even necessarily think it should have been nominated for anything. But I would have liked to have seen more conversation about it. And there wasn't really. The film came out. It was hyped up. The film came out. A lot of people saw it. And then it was just sort of quietly forgotten. Yeah, exactly. It was it was it was just sort of left in a lay by somewhere. <laughs> like poor thing. And I think I think I think Johnny Depp's performance um, was was halfway between him as Raoul Duke in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and Marlon Brando in The Godfather. It's a very weird mix, and it's, it's Johnny Depp. But I think it's one of Johnny Depp's best performances personally. A lot of people have been saying that they. You know, I thought it wasn't great, it wasn't that strong. I, I thoroughly disagree. I thought he was excellent. I think there were a couple of performances that weren't so great. Benedict Cumberbatch, his accent kind of wavered a little bit. I still enjoyed his performance regardless of that. John Edgerton, he was excellent. Really, really clever character. Really, really interesting. Um, the way I would sum up Black Mass personally is that I think that it is this kind of... This era, I suppose, maybe um, this kind of this this run of films answer to The Godfather. I don't necessarily think it will go down as as long as The Godfather has. Well, it doesn't seem to have gone. Oh, it doesn't. At all. Absolutely, like <laughs> which is what you're making a point. About. Yeah, exactly. Um, I really, I, I, well, the entire time I watched it, I felt that the storytelling, that the cinematography, that the whole the whole feel of the movie was like The Godfather. I feel that they were cut from the same cloth, which is not necessarily. The best bits of the cloth for Black Mass, sadly. And also, unfortunately, Godfather got there several decades earlier. Well, there is that to it and as well. Basically, took all the territory. But I feel, I feel that if this film had come out, maybe in a different climate, in terms of well, of it's... what's popular, maybe it would have had a different reception. I, I just, I feel that that the world wasn't ready. <laughs> the world wasn't ready. No, I just feel that the I think Black Mass has been let down by. I think people, by, by I, the audience, I really think. I it think it'll really draw people. But it'll draw people back if it's really? if it's really good enough. It'll draw people back. I hope so. Get, I hope so. Eventually, it'll get the recognition it deserves as a sort of um, yeah, as an underappreciated sort of um, yeah. I'm saying. I, I mean, like, sisted to that at the same time, you know, within a few weeks of each other, Legend was released, the two, the two Tom Hardy's film, and that was shite. 
Like, that was not... A, I, I enjoyed it, but it wasn't what it should have been. It wasn't gritty. It was this Hollywood version of the Cray Brothers. It was... Uh, you had fucking Tom Marley doing an Alan Partridge voice for, for Reggie Grant. A shooter is a shooter! Uh, Steve Coogan in On The Hour. Like, <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. They should have got Tom Hardy and Steve Coogan to do it. And I want to see a Cray film done with two Steve Coogans. <laughs> That's what I want. <laughs> What, what a letdown legend was, and then uh, I think that I mean there is a possibility that the, I don't know, the, the failings Steve of Steve Coogan and Rob Brighton, <laughs> the trip does legend. Oh my god, yes! Um, I, I think poss- I, I, I genuinely do think the possibility is that the letdown that legend was. I think that affected the reception that Black Mass got because because it was such a delicate and slow film. I feel. That the 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 kind of the lacklusterness of legend may have made the the slow Godfathery Francis Ford Coppola style of Black Mass come across more come across worse. I I think that that might be a thing. I mean I might be talking out of my ass, but it's possible also that um, legend nabbed potential viewers from Black Mass. Yeah, uh, that too. People thought, well, I'll go see the Tom Hardy one, and uh, don't like. Things Johnny Depp's been in recently. I'll give that yeah, a absolutely. Oh well, never mind. But no, I think, I, like I said, I don't think it necessarily deserved any nominations. But I certainly think it, it should have been. It should have been spoken not, about. It deserves not to be forgotten. Yeah, absolutely. Right, Andrew. What is your biggest snub of well, this year? My biggest snub is black people. Black people. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I feel awkward putting myself out there as a spokesman for them because obviously <laughs> that's grossly inappropriate. But. <laughs> Yeah, no. Anyway, I'll, 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 stop, I'll, I'll stop there. No, yeah, black people, we're really sorry that Hollywood's dicked you out of an Oscar again, really. Um, Idris Elba deserves, well, I, I love Idris Elba, I think Obviously. he deserves awards for, well, definitely for Luther, but I think he got them at the BAFTAs, so, you know, that's good enough. Yeah. But Idris Elba deserves a recognition, and I mean, John Boyega, he got... um. The, the Rising Star of the BAFTAs, star, which yeah. is always a good award to get. Like, it's always promising. I was pleased to see that. But again, that's the BAFTAs. It's not the big Hollywood ones. Yeah, I feel absolutely. they need to start recognising the talent that is there. Yeah. Particularly the British talent that is there, because... Absolutely. Because, well, yeah, I, I think, I think I, it, doesn't say, it doesn't bear much more to say about, really, the kind of condition that the Oscars has been in this year. Like, it's, it's disgusting, to be honest. To be quite frank, I mean, I mentioned earlier Samuel L. Jackson, career best, and that man has done some incredible work, mm. and I hate for it is his career best, and not a single fucking mention was okay. given to okay. it. It's, it's disgusting. But anyway, let's move on to where we can make some more jokes. Our next category is the Eddie Redmayne Award for most obvious issue-based film featuring Eddie Redmayne. And the winner is... Eddie Redmayne! In the Danish world. Yeah. I mean, I I just wonder what minority he's going to play next. To be honest, he's done disabled. He's done done transgender. I think we should start taking bets, to be honest. He's not got an awful lot left. I mean, it's basically... Black I mean, or <laughs> black or minority ethnic. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, if he blacks up, that solves the problem we've just spoken about. So, <laughs> I think that's a win-win for everyone, really. And you don't gets another one of our awards. The Academy doesn't have to nominate black people. Possible he may end up doing something like uh, Polish or something like that. Some sort of Ooh, white ethnic. refugee. Yeah. Yeah. I'm seeing something like that. Something... I mean, that's only if he's going to keep doing roles that could be done by someone else. I mean, you never know. Eddie Somebody Redman. else, some other star could win the Eddie Redmayne I Award. I believe there are Polish people who are actors. Fuck off, Andrew. Don't be stupid. <laughs> and now, the award you've all been waiting for, unless you've skipped ahead to this one, in which case, go back and listen properly. <laughs> please, please. <laughs> we need the stats. <laughs> Our best film award. Ryan, do you want to go first? My best film this year is... is It, uh, it was a difficult one for me, because The Revenant was, as I've mentioned earlier, a piece of pure cinema. And as as a film lover and more of a cinema lover as well, 
he thinks they're different things. Yeah, I do. I do. It's conceited, really, isn't it? No, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I was very torn because I feel as a as a piece of cinema, the Revenant drawing from you know all these world cinema elements and being you know fantastically made, the cinematography, the, the natural lighting, all that kind of stuff, the performances, the, the subtlety, the one dimensional characters, the one dimensional characters and plot. Yeah, that was great as well. Um, <laughs> No, I, I, I felt that that was probably the best piece of cinema this year. However, the best film, the film I enjoyed the most, Andrew? It was Star Wars, It wasn't was Star it? Wars. It was, it was Star Wars. Wars. We've both chosen Star Wars, we of have, course we have. We have both chosen Star Wars because it was so special. It really Star was. Wars we won't go on for too long because... We did we do a did podcast talk about on it, it for an in hour. all fairness. You've heard how lovingly we've talked about Star Wars. And if you haven't, go watch it, please, for the love of God. <laughs> I'm nodding, by the way. Yeah. You should totally do that. Yeah. But yeah, Star Wars, it was so special. And we couldn't have chosen anything else because no other film made us feel like Star Wars did. So yeah. It was an experience. It was, I, it was a... I felt like someone did would have felt in 1977, like, or whatever it was, like... And just knowing that it wasn't terrible... Yeah. Coming out of the cinema thinking, I think I'm right in thinking that was really good. Yeah, it was it was an incredible mix between awe and relief. <laughs> like, <laughs> it to be was honest, great. All my doubts were forgotten when I first heard that music and the Star Wars appeared on the yeah. screen in the rolling sort of credits, and I just all, and, and, and all was forgotten. Also, I think I think I breathed a sigh when Buena Vista or Disney, the logo didn't appear. After yes. the Lucas just, films did, like saw Lucas like films, saw saw the Star Wars like that's all I needed. If if Disney had fucking put the little Mickey Mouse face on it, I would have, I would have had a little cry. I think I, I would have, it would have jarred. But, yeah. Um, yeah. So Star Wars gets best film without uh, a doubt. So, that concludes the first annual Atlas Film Reviews Podcast Award Ceremony. Congratulations once again to our winners, who uh, were very deserving in our eyes. Um, John Boyega and Mark Ruffalo are still fighting it out in the battle cage. It's, it's brutal. It's gotten bloody, like really bloody. They want this. They, <laughs> I don't think this is even about our awards anymore. I think this is. they have some serious beef. So... Please join us next month. Um, we'll be back, hopefully, to our usual debauched podcasting style. Um, Blue Velvet, we, yes, uh, we are yet to do. Blue Velvet. Blue Velvet. To figure out what the hell is going on. Absolutely, and we'll find some more issues and such to talk about. Possibly superheroes, possibly something else. We'll have to wait and see. That's the surprise. Um, please feel free to like, comment and subscribe. Uh, or dislike if you didn't like it. Uh, there are two buttons. Use one of them. Fuck it. Um, and feel free to write to us a comment. We are immune to criticism. Uh, we we we're well, not. We're I, I, I'm immune to criticism. I, I'm not. I, I'm, Ryan's very sensitive. I'm very sensitive. I read poetry. I'm very sensitive. <laughs> Address all your insults to me at the, <laughs> at the Atlas Film Reviews <laughs> YouTube page. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening and joining us next month. Bye! Bye!